Put yourself in Mao Zedong's shoes for a second. The year is 1965 and you're still reeling from the horror of the Great Leap Forward. Your grand plan to see a true communist China that was also an economic powerhouse just didn't go to plan. Not only were there 30 million lives lost on your hands, but your own inner circle are now questioning the very vision that you had fought for through decades of civil war. It's safe to say that by 1965, Mao had pretty good license to feel alarmed. His great leap forward just hadn't worked and he'd taken a backward step from governing the country. And in his absence, Liao Xiaoqi, Dong Xiaoping and Zhao Enlai were now working to undo Mao's reforms. The communes that came in 1958 were now massively sailed back and work units consisted of only 30 people. Small plots of private land were allowed again and rural free markets opened up once more. Clearly, China's pursuit of pure communism had clearly been compromised to allow some elements of capitalism. Worse for Mao, his number two, Liao Xiaoqi, was playing a more prominent role in deciding the direction of the country as he led China's socialist education movement. For Mao, China was heading back towards a capitalist direction and he was at risk of being a figurehead like the Queen of England. A powerful title, but no clench on any real power. Hello there. Okay, so when discussing the Cultural Revolution, where Mao sought to take China off the capitalist road it had recently returned to and then doubled down on becoming a truly communist country, there are two main schools of thought. Firstly, that it was all a power grab for Mao, and secondly, that it was a purely ideological effort to make China more communist. And for me, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. Make no mistake, Mao was a hardened political operator at this point and he knew he had to act fast to not lose his grip on power, but at the same time, Mao's actions were actually fairly consistent with communist beliefs. In textbook Marxism, there's this concerning idea called Thermidor. Basically, the concept of Thermidor, which had its roots in the French Revolution, is that after successful communist revolutions, marks of the old society start to creep back in. For example, Russia is seen as the classic case of Thermidor because right after the October Revolution in 1917, came the new economic policy in 1922, which had many capitalist components to it. And so according to Marxist thought, after overthrowing the old government, there's this constant struggle to fight against Thermidor from happening. And so as Mao looked at Lao, Deng and Zhao moving back towards a free market system, he clearly saw Thermidor that had to be fought against. And so if Mao was going to stop guys like Lao, Deng and Zhao from taking the capitalist road, so to speak, he needed to recruit his own right-hand men to fight against them. And this group would become known as the Gang of Four. And so our first member of the Gang of Four was Chum Boda. Now Chun was a specialist in mass media and propaganda, and so he was given the job of chairing the new revolutionary group. Now he was prone to nervous fits, and in retrospect meets many of the signs of being a manic depressive, and so Mao felt confident that he could be controlled. The second member of the Gang of Four was Kang Shen. Now his job was to be the police and terror chief, and he actually watched the show trials from Stalin's purges firsthand, and his direct boss was Deng Xiaoping. But why recruit someone who works for the enemy, you might ask? Well, for exactly that reason. He worked for the enemy, and he could spy on Deng himself. And the third member of the Gang of Four was Lin Biao. Now, Lin was appointed as the head of the PLA, and that's the Chinese army, and he replaced Peng Dehuai, who was forced to resign after criticizing Mao during the Great Leap Forward. Now, interestingly, Lin Biao was petrified of water, and never bathed but instead used hot towels. His wife also dipped steam buns into water to ensure he actually drunk what he needed to. A very interesting character. Our fourth and final member was actually Mao's wife, Jiang Qing. To put it simply, she was much more along the lines of Hillary Clinton than, say, Michelle Obama as a wife to the leader. Now, back in 1938, her and Mao wanted to get married, but slight problem. Mao was already married to another woman. So Mao and Jiang and the party leadership came to an agreement that Mao could divorce his wife and remarry on the condition that Jiang set out of politics for 20 years. And so by 1966, it had been nearly 30 years and Jiang was ready to enter the game. And so towards the middle of 1966, Mao alluded to a new revolution of thoughts, culture, customs, and habits. He said that there were demons, rats, and ghosts in the party and country who were conspiring to derail the great communist revolution. These demons were class enemies of the people and were to be purged from positions of power. And so the first class enemies who were targeted with the universities. On the 25th of May 1966, a woman named Ni Yanxi accused the Peking University leader Lu Ping of being a capitalist and put up a less than positive poster about the leader of the university. Now the contents of the critical poster caught like wildfire and 65,000 were printed off and spread across Beijing University too. 
With Meow's retro kick against the demons, rats, and ghosts in the party, and with now a real figure to be named and shamed, there was an uprising amongst the Chinese students, and security stood by as Chinese students basically rioted. Remember, by 1966, the Communist Party had been in power for most of the students' lives, and their worldview was shaped along the lines of Mao Zedong thought. The purge of the demons, rats, and ghosts would have been seen for them as the new version of the Chinese Civil War. Now, these rioting students were given the title of Red Guards, and throughout the Cultural Revolution, they went from being angry students to something of an organized force. Now, Lao Shaoqi was quick to criticize his guards for their uproar, but he unfortunately played his hand a little too quickly as Mao went on to praise them for fighting against the class enemies. For the Red Guards, university and school was out, and the revolution was well and truly underway. Those deemed as class enemies would be frequently beaten and flogged, and in some cases, such as the Minister for Coal, killed. Some were deported to the countryside, and religious people such as Buddhists and Russian Orthodox Christians in Harbin were also targeted. Violence was not seen as a negative word if used against class enemies. As the revolution against the demons and the rats was underway, the new Gang of Four were proving to be very useful for Mao. Lin Biao's Red Book of Mao sayings functioned as the Bible for the Red Guards, and his PLA helped the Red Guards to take out key class enemies and take over the cities. Kang Sheng used the secret police to enact brutality, and Chen Boda organized posters attacking the enemies, and even created a number against Lao Shaqi himself. And then Zhang oversaw all books, films, and theater to make sure only pro-revolutionary media made it through. And we're going to finish by looking at the demise of Lao Shaoqi. Now, already incredibly skeptical of Lao, Mao was totally put offside when he opposed the initial Red Guard uprising. Now, Lao offered self-criticism, a common practice where if a CCP member annoyed Mao, they were forced to humiliatingly go public on why they were wrong, but this self-criticism was futile for Lao. Along with Dong Xiaoping, his name was dragged through the mud in China's August rallies. In public rallies, Lin Biao accused Lao of betraying the CCP back in the Civil War in 1929, and his daughter and ex-wife came out and publicly called him a capitalist. He was called China's version of Nikita Khrushchev in Russia. Lin Biao replaced him as Mao's number two in August of 1966, and he asked Mao if he could resign and actually work in the countryside, but Mao refused and placed Lao under house arrest. Now, he split him up from his wife, and in October of 1968, Lao was officially expelled from the party. Now, interestingly, it was Zhao Enlai who read the expulsion verdict out to Lao. If you remember, Zhao was born on Lao's side of things, but Zhao did what he needed to do to survive. In 1969, Lao Shaoqi died from diabetes-related complications as an enemy of the party. It wouldn't be until 1980 when the new chairman, his old friend, Deng Xiaoping, would go public about the fact that Lao was no enemy of China. Make sure to come back next time where we look at the second half of the Cultural Revolution in the 1970s and see the beginning of the end for Mao. We also get a visit from a certain American president. Make sure to smash that like button and hit notifications and subscribe so you don't miss anything. And we'll see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part.